glorious digitally restored presentation of the Wizard of Oz remastered in Dolby digital stereo it's a picture that until this week I had never seen in its entirety in a movie theater <laughs> how great looking is this version consider the now flawless sepia tones that set the mood for Dorothy's Dust Bowl Kansas farm if happy little bluebirds fly beyond the rainbow why When the film switches to color as Dorothy arrives in Oz, I was dazzled by the intensity of the colors, as I expected to be, but I was also struck by the elaborate and undoubtedly expensive details of the production, including the costumes worn by the Munchkins. Follow the yellow brick road. Follow the yellow brick road. Road. Now, spending that much time and money wasn't necessary to the story, but such details contribute to the all-encompassing entertainment values of a movie from another era of filmmaking. Oh, I agree with you. And this movie, of course, is on the AFI's list of the 10 greatest American films of all time and deserves to be. And just one footnote, you can't go wrong seeing this movie anywhere it's playing in a theater right. because it's going to look so much better than on television. Yes. But there are two color versions around. Most theaters are showing Eastman color, and some theaters are showing the three-strip dye transfer Technicolor process, a new Technicolor process that tries to duplicate the, the classic three-strip exactly. process of uh, more than 50 years ago. They both look good, but if you can find the three-strip Technicolor, that looks really great. Yes, it is measurably better, brighter. Uh, the colors are far more intense. Wizard of Oz is, by common agreement, one of the most magical movies ever produced by Hollywood, a movie you can love when you're a kid and love even more when you're a growing up. It's been an almost constant release since it was first made in 1939, and it's a bestseller on videotape. But now a new Laserdisc edition of The Wizard of Oz from the Criterion Collection contains some fascinating additional material about the movie. I could while away the hours, conferring with the flowers, consulting with the rain. And my head, I'd be scratching while my thoughts were busy hatching if I only had a brain. Everybody remembers this sequence from the movie, but the disc includes outtakes of footage that was trimmed from MGM's final release version. Here's how the longer version would have continued. Look at this. Don't worry if the camera seems to be shaking. These are rare home movies taken on the set of The Wizard of Oz by Harold Arlen, who wrote the music for the movie. His camera shows the trick behind those magical trees. Each one had a man inside to make the limbs move. And here's one of the special effects guys now coming up for air. All the critters cut me dancing on a thousand toes. Now she blew. The laser disc includes stuff you didn't even know you wanted to know, including footage from the 1925 silent version of the story. And there's a shot-by-shot -shot soundtrack commentary by film critic Ronald Haver. The Wizard of Oz is another in a new generation of laser discs for dyed-in-the-wool movie fans who want more than the movie. They want the history, the background, the coming attractions trailers, the original publicity stills, and everything else they can get their hands on. This is the definitive collector's edition of one of the greatest musicals of all time. Oh, you get things like the original drawings of the ruby slippers, which everyone is all the rage, and there was a big auction uh -huh. over, and you can see how they were drawn differently in the very beginning. You see uh, the, there's this radio play. Uh -huh. You see Marquis when they had a re-release with Judy Garland on it, and they didn't, because Judy Garland was so popular as a singer, uh -huh. they used an older Judy Garland rather, picture rather than uh, when she's older, 
than yeah. uh, when uh -huh. uh, she was a little kid in the film. Uh, it's everything that, there. We have to tell people that if you want to get this laser disc version, you have to have a laser disc player to put it in the, <laughs> to play it. But uh, if you can do it, if you can afford to buy one, they run anywhere from about four and a quarter to seven hundred bucks. Uh, this is a whole c industry that we keep mentioning time and time again. It's worth investing in because you can get not only better sound, better picture, but you can get more material on great films. Next at the movies, a special x-ray segment as we take another further look at the Oz film. Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> The subject of today's X-ray, the wonderful world of Oz. And that world seems all the more wonderful after seeing Return to Oz, which, as we mentioned just a moment ago, seems to lose track of the cheerful innocence of the original movie and get carried away by the current fashion for scary special effects. The original 1939 Wizard of Oz remains one of the greatest movies ever made, a film that still gets good ratings whenever it plays on television, and the kind of film that parents and grandparents love to see for the first time with their kids and grandkids. Take them to see The Wizard of Oz and share the experience. I don't think there's much in Return of Oz you'd want to share, especially with the younger children, unless you want to share a sleepless <laughs> night with them later. Right. The movie is curiously grim and downbeat. Here's a sample scene. Oh, no. Just a yellow brick. No, Belina, you don't understand. This was the yellow brick road. Oh. It leads to the Emerald City. Well, that'd be okay if the yellow brick road ever got repaired. But they even got the road wrong. Got the road wrong. <laughs> but the road isn't all. It's lost its magic and its glow in this new Oz. And to make the contrast, let's go back to 1976 and The Wiz, a musical directed by Sidney Lumet and starring in this scene Diana Ross and a young Michael Jackson. The Wiz was not a box office success, but that scene shows that at least they did understand something of the special magic of The Wizard of Oz and its carefree spirit of adventure. Now look at the original scene from the original movie. Follow the yellow brick road. 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 Follow, follow, follow. It makes you want to see the whole movie yeah. all over again. Now, of course, it's easy to praise a classic and easy to criticize Return to Oz for daring to invite comparison with a classic like that, but I'm not even talking here about the artistry and craftsmanship of the various Oz films. I'm talking about the spirit. And the question that Return to Oz ought to ask itself is, Birds fly over the rainbow, so why, or oh why can't I? It's a matter of tone. That's exactly what you're talking about. This film is a high-tech kind of film. The business of her flying over with that carpet that we saw mm -hmm. in the clip there before just seems recycled a lot of every other Every other picture. Disney film in particular. They always have something funny that flies. That was out of uh, bed knobs and broomsticks where right. the bed flew. Yeah. Um, again, I have to repeat my line, which is simply... I would stay away from classics. I would go to find some other territory that's fresh and, and do it. I would have put music into this film. You know, The Wiz, just by the virtue of its music, mm -hmm. seems like a film that I'd like to see again, mm -hmm. even though, as most everyone agreed, uh, uh, Diana Ross was uh, miscast as Dorothy. Mm -hmm. But at least there, the music was buoyant and joyful. This film is quite somber. Somebody should have thought, when they, at the very first, when they were yeah. starting on Return to Oz, somebody should have had this thought. 
it ought to be fun, it ought to be upbeat, it ought to be sweet, yeah. it ought to be wondrous. Yeah. It shouldn't be scary. <laughs> The take gone with the wind, and that's a great line. And oh, uh, he's going to look at here's line. what I noticed this time. <laughs> he reads it not like a great line. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. He rolls right over it. Uh -huh. His character doesn't know it's a great line, and a lesser actor would have read it as if it were he a great line. Claimed it, right? Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. I'm, you <laughs> are. You are disqualified as a lesser actor. Kathleen, who's there? Who? That man looking at us and smiling. The nasty dog. My dear, don't you know? That's Red Butler. He's from Charleston. He has the most terrible reputation. Scarlett O'Hara first sets eyes on Rep Butler in that famous moment from Gone with the Wind, a movie where almost every moment is famous. The movie, which recently placed fourth on the American Film Institute's much debated and criticized list of the 100 greatest American films, is back in national release in a good-looking restored print that allows us once again to decide what it's really about. The first time I saw it, I took it at face value. I thought it was the story of the Civil War seen through Scarlett's eyes. Wellman, Wendell, White, Whitner, Wilkins, Williams, Walden, Wood. Scarlett, get past him. Oh, he's oh. there. He isn't there. Ashley's safe. He isn't listening. He's safe. The second time, it was more like the story of Scarlett O'Hara with the Civil War as a backdrop. As God is my witness, they're not going to lick me. I'm going to live through this, and when it's all over, I'll never be hungry again. The third time, somehow, Rep. Butler seemed more contemporary, and Scarlett seemed dated. You do all survive, Captain Butler. Don't start flirting with me. I'm not one of your plantation bows. But this time, Scarlett has made a comeback in my imagination, I guess. It struck me as the story of Scarlett's passionate libido, which meets its match at last with the plain-spoken, unsentimental Rep. Butler. Is a soldier of the South who loves you, Scarlet. Wants to feel your arms around him. Wants to carry the memory of your kisses into battle with him. Never mind about loving me. You're a woman sending a soldier to his death with a beautiful memory. Of course, the performances by Vivian Lee and Clark Gable are movie milestones any way you look at them, but the movie itself offers a slanted and sentimental view of the Old South, which comes across as kind of a courtly utopia, just as long, of course, as you were not a slave. The film has a self-confidence in its storytelling and an intoxication in its epic images that still works, no matter how much we might want to reinterpret its hidden messages, which is, gee, this was a wonderful time uh, back in the old days. But South. I think, Roger, your final viewing, uh, you come around to the right opinion, which is, it's Scarlet's story. Yes, it I is. I mean, this yeah. is, and it's a beautifully acted performance. Over the years, in talking to actresses, they always name this as one of the great mm -hmm. performances of all time. She's, she, a, oh, man. she's a willful woman and among the things that she she has this idea of the Southern Belle who you know right. is attracted to the perfect gentleman Ashley Wilkes but actually in here she's really attracted to that cad Rep, Rep Butler and a lot of her motivation is more sexual I think now than I first realized. Well it's just the energy and the enthusiasm that she expresses she never never strikes a false note. Fascinating oh. character magnificently played. This hasn't seen Gone with the Wind. Well, if you're under 50 or so, chances are you never have really seen it in a movie theater in its full resplendent color. The classic 1939 film was filmed in the long gone three color technicolor process using three separate strips of film running through the camera and when combined the process produced glorious and subtle colors the likes of which have not since been duplicated. But Turner Entertainment Company, which now owns the rights of the film, in honor of its 50th anniversary, has paid for a painstaking reconstruction of Gone with the Wind, which has deteriorated over the years, and you can now see the film pretty much as audiences saw it 50 years ago. Let's take a look at the improvement by studying three different versions of the film that have played over the years. First, a 1954 version. Here you is, Miss Melanie. They was fighting for him, so it just got towed in hand. Scarlett, you look. The W's at the end. Now, here's a 1967 version. The flesh tones in Vivian Lee's face have washed out as if a light were shining in her face. And now, here's the restored version, the one that you can see right now in theaters, much more subtle and crisp. You can clearly make out the white trim around her cloak. Ashley's safe. He isn't safe. Oh, Scarlett, you're so sweet to worry about Ashley like this for me. And here's another scene as young boys salute the Confederate soldiers killed in battle. 
Notice how less harsh the red hats and blue jackets become as the film has improved over the years. Now, I saw this new version not on TV, where it was shown on cable nationally in November, but in a movie theater is where I saw it, and the improvements are much more noticeable than we were even able to show you just here on a TV screen. The film manages to be both epic and intimate, and has been scheduled for a revival tour around the country in the next few months, playing in just a few days in each major city. I certainly recommend you see this new version, especially if you haven't seen it in a long time. It's like rediscovering a classic. And credit to the Turner Entertainment Company for their restorative work. Ted Turner finally figured it out. You colorize color movies. Well, actually, what he's done here is not colorize the movie, but restore exactly. the color that was already I there. Was just... It's ironic that here's a man who has really made a great effort to restore this wonderful movie, and he's yes. done a terrific job. Yes. And it's the same guy who wants to trash movies like Citizen Kane and Casablanca. Yeah. He seems to have two different sides to his personality, but here, this is the uh, Dr. Jekyll side, if you will, because uh, I agreed with you. I went to see Gone with the Wind the other day, right. and it looks as good as I've ever seen it, and I've seen it in three other... Right. I saw it in 54 when it came out. Right. I even saw it in 1967. But you, I don't think you really and felt like... I mean, I, this was my experience, which was, wow. I mean, I, I was knocked back Yeah, by because it. you're not looking at grainy scenes and details that are lost in a muddy soundtrack and scratches on the, on the screen. Everything makes this movie look as fresh as if it came out yesterday, yeah. and you can see what a great movie it is. Now, the other thing is, you're told, the, the one advantage is, you know, you're told when you walk in, you're going to see something with pristine color. Yeah. And so uh -huh. you are sensitized to yeah. that, and as a result, it becomes an enriching experience. And uh, once I get freed up from that, I then start watching the interplay between Gable and Lay, and then... Yeah, and then you forget about the technical stuff, except once near the end of the movie, I notice something. This soundtrack, you know, they can, oh, do, I, I know. They can do amazing things with soundtracks now. Right. There's a scene where you can hear Clark Gable's shoes squeaking I know, I know. as he walks there. across the room. Now, this is something that probably the original audience couldn't hear. Well, it is uh, an exceptional film, that's to be sure, but it's been presented now in an exceptional way. They're playing it just for a couple of days in some cities. I wish they'd play it longer. Well, yeah. check your local listings. The sequel to Gone with the Wind, named Scarlet, has been published through almost unanimously bad reviews, but it's on the top of all the bestseller lists, and now it's been sold for $8 million to television. Yes, the sequel to the most famous movie of all time is going to be a miniseries, and so therefore, since we're on television, yeah. we can provide a useful service to the people who are making yeah. this uh, project. Who should play Scarlet and Rhett? And let's not beat around the bush, because it's a made-for-TV movie. Tom Selleck, a highly on. popular TV performer, is a probable choice. And on a recent Phil Donahue show, I saw it last night, it was, I think, a year old, he said he wouldn't take the part because, in his words, Clark Gable is irreplaceable. Well, he's right, but they are going to replace him. So my pick is an actor who I think will work well with my Scarlet. And this is the category I'm really sure of. My Scarlet is Demi Moore, a classic beauty from the South. She can play a spitfire, someone dreamy, someone willing to fight, someone willing to surrender. And you could see all that in her movie Ghost. Sam's dead. Okay? He's dead. Tell her I love her. He says he loves you. Sam would never say that. And who should play her, Rhett? Alec Baldwin from The Hunt for Red October. He's big enough, he'll tower over Demi Moore, just like Clark Gable towered over Vivian Lee. He's a ladies' man as well as a man's man. He has a slick side, a brusque side, as well as a charming side. You could see that in his picture, The Marrying Man. He was the best thing in the movie. I am crazy, nuts, absolutely insane for her. I think I've come up with a very compatible couple. It's not just picking two individuals. Will they work together? I think they will. Demi Moore might actually do the role. I don't know if anybody wants to follow Clark Gable. You know, I think one thing people are going to notice about your casting is that Red and Scarlet have both inexplicably gotten to be a lot younger since yeah. the original film instead of older, and I, I don't really think that's fair. I tried in casting the movie to get people who were in the right age, age segments, and I hope I did. When I think of the central quality of Red Butler, it's a sort of challenging, self-confident sexuality wrapped up in a tall, dark, and handsome facade. And although Tom Selleck has been mentioned for the role, darn it all, 
Tom Selleck is just too nice to play Rhett Butler. Also, his voice the squeaks in the uh, higher octave range. The role requires an actor who can project more of a hard edge, more of a menacing sexuality. An actor like Timothy Dalton, in my opinion. Now, I know Dalton is British, but so is Vivian Lee, and that didn't seem to bother anybody. Here's Dalton as James Bond, a character who has a lot in common with Rhett Butler. Would you get me a medium dry for a martini? What is Shaken, not stirred. In casting Scarlett O'Hara, there are three qualities you'll have to keep in mind. Her flightiness, her headstrong egotism, and her undeniable sexiness and charm. And there is one actress I can think of who would be terrific at combining those qualities with a convincing southern accent and who is the right age, and that actress is Meryl Streep. I would love to work with you when you make your move. I think we would knock them right on their fannies. <laughs> you really like to win, don't you? When I want something, I go get it. And so I think Dalton and Streep would blow Demi Moore and Alec Baldwin out of the water. I, Streep is our greatest actress. I'm sure she could do the role. She won't get anywhere near it. It, it can only be a downside for her career. But more important, Timothy Why Dalton... Why would it be a downside to play Scarlett O'Hara? Beca because she will say, I'm, I'm trading with a classic. I can only lose. I but here, know. Timothy Dalton, I think, is basically sort of too, he's a fine actor, too narrow, um, sort of has a whiny quality to him. He doesn't have that big, imposing, tree-like quality yeah. in the best sense of Gable. That's well, why it's going to be tougher to find someone to, of quality to play Gable. Okay, what do you think? Okay.